by now you've probably heard the name Palantir. Maybe in a news headline about secretive spy software, AI arms race, or public sector surveillance. But what if I told you it's not just a government tool? Let's break down what Palantir actually is, why it's always in the headlines, and what its shift into the commercial world actually means. Palantir was founded with CIA ties, with founding members a part of the PayPal mafia, so it's always had a shadowy vibe. The headlines are always talking about government surveillance and military industrial complex tool gone rogue. One of the founding members, Peter Thiel, gave a four-part lecture series on the Antichrist. He's doing a four-part lecture on the Antichrist, and nobody in his inner orbit went, Peter, how about one lecture on the Antichrist or no lectures? Not four. Well, I don't think he understands the optics. So it makes sense why Palantir's name is sometimes looped in with fear-mongering type headlines. This leads to people only seeing Palantir as a surveillance company and not the true platform underneath. The company was founded by a larger group, but two of the more notable names are Peter Thiel and Alex Karp. Thiel is known for his strong opinions on technology and society. Karp, on the other hand, really hammers home American exceptionalism and embeds that into the company's culture while acting as the CEO. They both stand out from most tech leaders. Teal likes to debate and go on podcasts. I think he was on JRE about a year ago. Carp, on the other hand, likes to really bring a bombastic vibe to their earnings calls, where he sounds really confident and excited about the company's future, rightly so. Sometimes these tendencies make them hard to understand or hard to follow, but it's really what sets them apart from the tech landscape and other CEOs. Because of this, Palantir has a rep of being bold and different. Some people love it, some people hate it, but that just comes with the territory with Palantir. But either way, the leadership of Palantir, along with their bleeding edge implementations, are constantly keeping them in the headlines. So why are people scared of Palantir? I see comments all the time like, they own you and all of your data and you can't take a piss without them knowing. That's blown out of proportion. I get it though, Palantir does sound scary. It's named after a all-seeing stone in the Lord of the Rings series. It's tied to the government, CIA, defense contracts, three-letter agencies, you name it. And it may seem that they have all-seeing control of your data. But here's the truth most people miss. Palantir doesn't own your data. Palantir is the infrastructure that helps you make sense of your data, or rather the company that has your data. Palantir works like plumbing for information. Palantir builds the system that carries your data where it needs to go, but at the end of the day, the customer owns the data. The customer in this sense is either the government agency that's implementing Palantir, so they already have their hands and own the data that they're implementing Palantir to streamline, or the commercial corporation that owns the data, like their ERP or CRM data, and how that all connects. They own that data. It's just using and leveraging Palantir to better streamline and aggregate that data into a usable data set. When a hospital uses Palantir, it could be their patient data. When an airline uses Palantir, it could be their flight and passenger lists. When a government uses Palantir, it's their intelligence data. Palantir as the actual organization can't see your data unless they're explicitly given access in their internal environment to do so. Long story short, a company owns their data. Their data is locked down due to their infrastructure and their governance controls like any other platform would be. This is standard across the SaaS industry. <laughs> The misconception and fear factor of Palantir comes from how the ontology looks from the outside. We'll explain the ontology in the next section a little deeper. On the outside, it looks like a seamless web of connections, people, data, objects, and they just assume that Palantir has access to all of these things when that's really not the case. The ontology isn't some global hive mind. It's a model inside of each customer's environment in their own unique implementation. It's the digital twin of their company, not the world. On that note, I want to level set on two definitions that I'll be harping on during this video. One of those being the digital twin of your organization. A digital twin you could see is the digital representation of your company, all of its actions, objects, and core functions. It's like a live data-driven model of your organization, connecting people and their processes to a, their digital counterpart. Second is the decision infrastructure. What I mean by decision infrastructure is that connected data layer that turns decision to action. In Palantir, that's combining the ontology with workflows and AI to really drive towards an action, not just a data decision. Anyways, 
The software doesn't become some all-knowing system taking every Palantir user's data, aka every Palantir customer's data, and looping it into some master hive mind data set. That may be a conspiracy, but that's not proven in the real world. The fear mongering comes from what could be done with Palantir in the wrong hand, which I'll give it to you. It, it is a little frightening. For example, a bad actor could use Palantir to leverage the data that they've already collected and maybe keep a closer eye on people that they really shouldn't be keeping a closer eye on. You know, if you can think of like the Patriot Act and the way that that enabled the government to survey their public when there was no constitutional right to do so. You know, this Palantir technology could theoretically in that sense be leveraged to clamp down further on the public. But for me, I'm interested in seeing what Palantir is doing in practice at organizations in the real world. Palantir is a software company, but not your typical SaaS. Software is a service. Palantir builds platforms like Gotham, Foundry, AIP, Apollo that connect your disjointed data, databases, unstructured reports, and live operations into a unified data layer, source of truth rather. Imagine your company as a living organism. Every process, data stream, and decision path represented digitally. That's the decision infrastructure. Not just seeing what happened, but seeing what could happen, feeding that into workflows, and anticipating the future. In its early days, Palantir started on the battlefield. That was taking troop positions, satellite imagery, radar scans, thermal scans, other battlefield sensors that are littered across entire countries. All of those sensors and data sources are owned by different companies, speak their own language in terms of how the data is stored. So really kind of before Palantir came on the scene, generals and decision makers would have to parse through a bunch of disjointed data sources, bring it into one centralized location and figure out how to make a decision about what their next strategic move should be on the battlefield. Enter Palantir, they were able to make all that data speak the same language. So connect every disjointed data service into one centralized usable data set, which then enabled way faster decision-making from the top down in our military operations. In short, Palantir came in and unified the data. One data set, one decision engine. Fast forward a few years, swap drones for IoT, troop positions for supply chain flows, satellite imagery for production data, it's the same chaos, just a different environment. Palantir becomes the system that unifies ERP, CRMs, PIM systems, factory floor data, building that digital twin of your company so you can make decisions more efficiently. Just like the generals in the battlefield, your decision leaders at your company now have access to real-time data and can have a decision engine for that data. To that point, Palantir has fully shifted into the commercial world with now almost an even split of government contracts and commercial contracts. In Q3 of 2025, that commercial pivot really shows. Take a look at the numbers. Exceeding revenue goals, increasing their future revenue projections, groundbreaking partnerships like the recently announced partnership with NVIDIA. That's the world's leading chip maker using Palantir, Foundry, and AIP to run their operations for their shop floor maintenance. That's insane. What these numbers tell me is Palantir is no longer a battlefield defense contracting agency software. It's being used in the front lines of the boardroom. Palantir's ontology is what sets it apart from nearly every other data platform out there. It's not just a direct data model. It's an operational layer for the organization. The ontology sits on top of all the digital assets integrated into Palantir, connecting them to their real world counterparts. That means everything from equipment and buildings to customers transactions, and even people have a living digital representation inside of Foundry. Think of the ontology as both the semantic layer, aka what things are, how they're related, and the kinetic layer, what they can do and how they interact. Objects, properties, and links define meaning, while actions and functions define behavior. Together, they form a digital twin of the organization that can sense, react, and evolve in real time. For example, imagine a hospital system built on Palantir. Each doctor, patient, medical unit is represented as an object in the ontology. As patient volume rises in one facility, the system predictive agents can automatically rebalance available doctors across hospitals based on forecast demand, current workloads, and real-time capacity. The ontology doesn't just describe what's happening, it enables action. Doctors can be reassigned, appointments adjusted, and supplies rerouted, all from one connected model. This is where Palantir's ontology becomes more than a database. 
It's a living operational model that powers decision making at scale. It ensures every data set, process, and human action stays aligned with reality, giving organizations the ability to adapt instantly to change. So you might be thinking, well, how does a company actually build this ontology? Because it's one thing to say digital twin, and it's another to actually create it. In reality, it starts with data. Data is the oil of this generation, and it will continue to be leveraged by the companies who have a foundation in place to enable it. So a data pipeline in Palantir pulls information from every core system a company runs on, your ERPs, your CRMs, HR teams, finance data, spreadsheets, IoT sensors on the shop floor, you name it. Foundry's integration layer ingests that data, cleans it, and standardizes it into a common structure that makes sense to your organization. Once that foundation is in place, engineers and business owners begin defining the actual ontology objects, the core entities that represent how the company actually works. For a manufacturer, those may be products, machines, orders, suppliers, customers, and employees. Each object holds relevant data attributes, maybe the supplier's region, the product's batch ID, the machine's maintenance history. But these objects aren't static tables, they have relationships and behaviors. A product might know which machines build it. A machine object might expose an action like request maintenance or optimize throughput. An order might trigger a downstream workflow that checks inventory or launches a simulation when demand spikes. And because every object understands its place in the network and those who depend on it, who consume its data and what it can do next, you get a living interconnected system. It's not just data stitched together, it's context encoded into the architecture of your organization. That's why Palantir calls it ontology-driven operations. It's how AIP can talk to your data intelligently because the data has meaning and actionable insights. Once that ontology is in place, everything else becomes possible. Suddenly, you can start doing things like spotting machine failures before they happen, rerouting your supply chain on the fly, modeling the financial impact of adding a second shift, or letting an analyst ask, what happens if we move production to Spain, and actually getting an instant simulation of that ask. Here, we can see a bunch of real-world examples in the commercial sector of how Palantir and AIP are used to actually solve real world problems. These range from predictive maintenance to supply chain simulation to scenario modeling, operational dashboards, agentic workflows, and data governance, all looped into one platform. For example, you'll see some classic business processes like AP automation. You'll see process optimization frameworks, inventory rebalancing. This one sticks out to me is material harmonization, taking SDSs, quotes, and other material specs and being able to derive attributes via an AI agent to achieve an outcome. We see supply chain logistics, AI base plates for construction, and dynamic pricing for retail based on maybe zip codes. So there's so many use cases here, all of these powered by AI. And this should really go to show that Palantir is not just a, a military use case anymore. They've been able to pivot and show the ability for portfolio managers and private equity to utilize the platform to become more efficient. Really amazing stuff, and the use cases are endless. When people hear the name Palantir, it's easy just to default to Skynet. Terminator reference, the technology that pretty much powered all those AI robots to murder all of humanity. Palantir being tied to government work, intelligence agencies, the battlefield pivoted now towards commercial data. I get it. It's scary. It's scary to think of a company that knows everything about the military world, the commercial world, and your personal data. I could see why that'd be very alarming if the company was to actually aggregate all of that data into their own and use it against the public. And look, I'm all for smaller government, less intrusive oversight. I dislike the Patriot Act and more personal freedom at the end of the day. But here's the thing. To blame the tool for how it's used is missing the point. The hallmark of capitalism is this. When there's a need, the market finds a solution. Palantir isn't the villain here, it's the responder. It built the solution to the need. The market's demanding data agility and operational AI. And Palantir jumped on that need to create a solution. Unplug Palantir because they're successful at it, another company will fill that gap. That's capitalism. In a world overflowing with data, machine sensors on the shop floor in power plants, industry facilities, to global supply chains connected by boats, trains, airplanes, to hospitals, war zones. The world is overflowing with data. 
Each second, more data is created than these legacy systems can even begin to handle, let alone leverage. That's why a platform like Palantir exists in the first place, to bring order to that chaos and leverage and harness all this data that's out there. The fear around Palantir really always comes from the fear of what could happen if Palantir was to be used in the wrong way, not from actually what's happening in practice today. And yes, I'm not dismissing that concern at all. If Palantir were to start harnessing every customer's data that that customer put into Palantir privately and was to steal that data and bring it up as an overlord of the data, I would be on this very channel speaking out against that. That's illegal. I would be very against that, but I don't think that's what's happening. If anything, I think the lesson here is that with progress always comes responsibility. The technological advancements of Palantir have unlocked many new use cases and abilities to leverage data more valuably but that comes with the responsibility to do it ethically. The real question isn't whether or not the technology is good or bad, it's what we decide to do with it. If you're someone who works with data and is maybe a little more hands-on and wants to see the tool for themselves, jump over to my channel. I have a full playlist called Foundry Fastlane where we get our hands on the tool for free and actually set you up with Palantir Foundry. That'll allow you to get your hands on the tool and make up your own opinion using it yourself. If you liked this video, then stay tuned for the rest of this series, The Truth About Palantir. We'll dive into Palantir's founding, its upbringing, its expansion, controversy, and real world use cases in the commercial sector. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.